This is a short talk about the Royal Observatory Cape of Good Hope that I prepared for the SAAO 200 meeting. It, it owes its beginning to the Board of Longitude in London. That's the body that was concerned about finding positions at sea to help seafarers and make, make traveling safer. They had decided that the quality of star data available in the Southern Hemisphere had fallen long behind that in the Northern Hemisphere because nothing new had been done in the way of surveying the sky since Nicholas Louis de la Caille around 1750. So accordingly, one of their members, Davies Gilbert, who was concerned with those sort of things, proposed the formation of a new observatory at the Cape of Good Hope. And this was finalized and got through the government by 20th of October of 1820. They selected a young Cambridge mathematician called Fearon Fallows to be the first director. He was a contemporary of people like John Herschel and Charles Babbage, the computer guy. They also ordered appropriate state-of-the-art instruments to be used in the new observatory. Well, Fallows set off for the Cape and got there in August of 1821. He started off by building an observatory downtown for temporary use, and he started looking for a more permanent site outside town. He eventually selected the present site, six metres above sea level, nicely visible from ships within Table Bay. The main building was begun in 1825 and finished in 1828, but in the meantime there had been a budget cutback, so unfortunately few little details like roads, fences and toilets were never really finished. Unfortunately for him, Fellows contracted a fever and died in 1831, so he only had three years use of the observatory to he'd taken so much care over. This is a plan of the observatory. On the left on the right you see two large residences suitable for 19th century gentlemen to live in. In the middle, on the left side, was the room containing the mural circle for measuring declinations, and on the right the room for measuring for the, the transit instrument for measuring right ascensions. The building opened up along the north-south line because that's all you needed to have for if you were only just measuring star positions. This is a picture of the observatory as it existed 15 years later. You see domes on top. These were never used because they were useless because they were just mounted on top of the ceilings and there's too much shaking for any to be useful for any kind of astronomy. The picture was taken by Piazzi Smith, a young astronomer who was made chief assistant at the age of 15, stayed till he was 25, and then became astronomer royal for Scotland. He was the first person to take photographs in South Africa, so it's a historical photograph in itself, apart from being a very early picture of an observatory. Fellows was succeeded by Thomas Henderson. He only stayed about a year. He was a fussy person who couldn't stand the conditions here. But he was warned by uh, one of his colleagues, that was a, a young guy called Manuel Johnson, who worked at the observatory in St. Helena that had been founded by the British East India Company. He was told by this man that, that Alpha Centauri had actually changed its position by about three arc minutes since the time of Lakai. But this was a huge pop of motion and it indicated that it was probably quite a near star to us. Accordingly, Henderson measured the position of Alpha Sen over a year and he found that in fact it did have a measurable parallax. Now, the parallax had been predicted by from the work of Copernicus in 1543, but had never been successfully observed because this was so very small. But the state-of-the-art instruments that we had at the Cape were enough that it could be detected. Unfortunately, Henderson didn't write up his results straight away, but he held onto them, and he was actually scooped by Bessel from Königsberg in East Prussia, who measured another star in the meantime and published before him but in fact, he does have the priority in terms of actually acquiring the data, even if he failed to capitalize on it. So he lost most of the kudos involved. 
He also had to worry about a time service. They needed time for internal purposes, and the clock at the bottom is the one they used at the beginning of the observatory. Above it is a signal pistol, so the astronomer had to go on the roof and fire this at a certain time, according to a stopwatch he was carrying, and that enabled it, it uh, enabled the captains on the ship to set their chronometers if they had them. On the left is a time ball. This particular one was in use until about 1930, when radio took over, and on the right you see a typical ship's chronometer. These were very expensive and not many ships had them. They mostly had to rely on the method of lunars. Thomas McClear was the next astronomer. He was a much tougher character and he soon got the place sorted out. He had to observe positions of stars like all the others, but he also had to do geodetic surveying and he had to check up on some results of Lacaille's that seemed to indicate the Earth was a bit pear-shaped. He also gave his name to numerous places around the Cape, most of which, well, for example, Cape Point, Cape McClear, uh, and uh, there was another Cape McClear in Lake Malawi, there was a, a beacon on the top of Table Mountain, and a town of McClear. He was also the custodian of weights and measures for the colony, and he was expected to give weather forecasts from time to time, though he wasn't terribly successful at that. He was buried on the observatory grounds when he died. And next, just worth mentioning, is David Gill, who is the fifth of Her Majesty's astronomers. He was actually a very brilliant astronomer. He started off life as a watchmaker, so he had enormous skill in instrument design as well as being a very good astronomer. He had only been in office about three years when he got a letter containing this picture from a person called William Simpson, who lived in the Cape town of Aberdeen. What was nice about this picture was that, apart from showing a newly arrived comet, it showed some white dots which were actually images of stars. Up till then, photographic plates hadn't been sensitive enough to record stars. So Gill realized he had a very useful discovery on his hands. He could make a catalog, he could make a sky catalog based on photography where you could look at a number of stars at once, and also you had a permanent record of what you were doing. Accordingly, he had this telescope made on the left side, this wooden box with a six inch photographic lens at the top, normally used for portrait photography, and it would have had photographic plates fixed at the bottom. It was mounted on a normal telescope mount so it could follow the stars. Now he realized that measuring up all these plates and reducing them to catalog information was going to be a huge task. So he managed to persuade Jacobus Captain from Groningen to help him with that part of the work. So between the two of them, they produced this catalog of about 450,000 stars called the Cape Photographic Dirk Mustrel. It was named that because the equivalent one for the Northern Hemisphere was the Bonner Dirk Mustrum, although it had been assembled laboriously, star by star, by visual means. Well, Gill was very keen to get involved in astrophysics. He knew people like George Ellery Hale and William Huggins, and he asked the Admiralty for money for a suitable telescope, but they said, no, that's not their business. But fortunately, a certain person called Frank McLean had been visiting the Cape and had actually used the Cape telescopes to discover the presence of oxygen in stars. And he offered Gill a present of a telescope installation, which you see above. So he, he built this McLean telescope with a laboratory attached to it, and inside was a 24-inch telescope with a spectrograph and a few other odds and ends. Top left, you see the photographic, the spectroscopic laboratory that was part of the telescope, and it was used by J Joseph Lunt to discover silicon and uh, europium in stars. Down bottom left is how the lab looked in 1971 when I came to the observatory, and I used it for my infrared purposes. When, when we got a new lab, then the lab, that one became free, and it was turned into a museum where I managed to assemble just about all the little instruments that were still left that hadn't been stolen or taken home as souvenirs. 
to go back to Gill. He was responsible for several buildings that still exist. You see in the middle top, that's the heliometer dome. It's, heliometer was a special telescope for measuring double stars, but it was protected by a louvered system that stopped it from getting too hot during the heat of the day. The top right was the astrographic telescope. It's one of about 12 telescopes around the world, inspired by Gill's work on the Cape Photographic Dirk Mustrum, and it was called the Carte du Ciel. So a number of observatories each took over a certain part of the sky and took photographs of it in detail. At the bottom was the reversible transit circle designed by Gill, which was the best of its kind and copied by other people afterwards for quite a few decades. Well, the best period of the Royal Observatory was this one, around about 1890 to 1915. And you see top left a visit from Eddington and some other people in 1914. But at the back is Jacob Halm. He was one of the most interesting people at the observatory, a pioneer of stellar dynamics, a person who first noticed the mass luminosity relationship for stars, and also he first explained P. Signy profiles in stellar spectra. Next to him is Lund. He was the person that I mentioned who worked in the lab to find the existence of silicon stars and europium. Bottom left is Robert Innes. He's the person who found Proxima Centauri, which even today is still the nearest star. Middle of the top, you see uh, Willem de Sitter. He was, of course, uh, he came to, uh, to learn some practical astronomy. He'd been a student of captains, and he was sent out to work with Gill for a bit. But afterwards, he was very famous as the person who found the solution to Einstein's equations that implied possibility of an expanding universe. On the right top, you see uh, Franklin Adams. He was the first person to conduct a survey photographic survey of a whole sky using a telescope which he moved from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. And bottom right is, is John Wout. He was a Dutch volunteer who was interested in photographic astrometry and a pioneer of that. Well, the observatory has a very nice library with some very interesting old books and a series of journals going back to the first issue. In particular, we have the French Academy of Sciences, the Royal French Academy of Sciences, and uh, it's probably the only set in the country. On the left, you see the archives of the observatory. They, they're the work of R.P. Slotograph and myself. We went around the observatory looking in basements, in attics, in corners of offices and sheds, and we found quite a lot of interesting archival material that had been completely neglected for quite a great many years. So we tried to catalogue this as best we could. The last decade of the Royal Observatory was quite a traumatic affair. Unfortunately, the kind of work being done here wasn't very sexy, and so it, get, it tended to be cast aside by the British astronomical community. And, and uh, However, the bottom left person, Stoy, did his best to get the place up to date he managed to get hold of a one meter telescope, which is now at Sutherland, although it was at the Cape at first. Uh, he also realized the need for a new site, and he and Evans, his chief assistant, spent some time observing at Sutherland and site testing there. You see that in the bottom picture in the middle with the present site in the background. By about 1967, the Brits decided to put the money into a project in Australia, and so the observatory looked like it was going to be closed. However, Stoy and Evans both left at this point for greener pastures, but very soon afterwards, there was an agreement reached between the UK Science Research Council and the South African CSIR to start a new observatory at Sutherland, and George Harding, bottom right, was brought in as officer in charge for the last little period of the Royal Observatory. So he, in fact, was the person who got Sutherland organized and started. So we owe him quite a debt, in fact. And you see in the top left, the, uh, the a pamphlet that was put out for the 150th anniversary of the observatory. And of course, only one year later, it was closed. 
So I arrived just just before it was closed, three months before it was closed. And of course, uh, I worked most of the time for the SAAO. So that's the end of the Royal Observatory and of this lecture. Thank you very much.